Welcome to lecture 14 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. The next two lectures are going to be going over the epistle written to the people in Rome, which we call the Book of Romans. So let's get started. So let's look at the introduction to the Book of Romans. Letter A. This book was written by the Apostle Paul, and he directly states this in the very first verse of Romans chapter 1, verse 1, when he addresses the individuals he's writing this to. Then letter B, this book was written sometime between A.D. 57 and 58, which obviously this is more of a guess than anything, but this is kind of the date range that um, very intelligent theologians have put together. And then letter C, this book was written to the Christians in Rome. This one is kind of obvious. That's why it's called the Epistle to the Romans. But it was written to the Christians in Rome. Now, the origin of this church is unknown. We do not know how it started, who started it. There is one theory that Peter started this church. However, there is very little evidence that Peter started this, and there's very little evidence that he got there before other Christians had even gotten there. In fact, we don't even believe Paul started this church because he mentions that he had not even been there yet when he's writing this letter. So then, how did this church get started? Most likely, it was by the spreading out of the gospel throughout the world after the day of Pentecost. Since if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 10, you'll find that some of the individuals that got saved on the day of Pentecost were from Rome. And what did they naturally do? They went back to Rome after Pentecost and told other people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, John Mark may have gone here in the early 50s before Paul to help them in their indoctrination. And Aquila and Priscilla are both said to be from Rome. And in Romans 16 verse 3, it shows that they did return there. So, who started the Church of Rome? We do not know the exact individual. There's very little evidence it was Peter. It could not have been Paul. But we know that most likely the spread of the gospel got there because of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Roman number two, the purpose and importance of the book of Romans. Now, this is going to answer the question, why was it written? Well, letter A, it was firstly written to emphasize the righteousness of God, to show that God is righteous, and the opposite of God being righteous is that man is sinful. And because man is sinful, letter B, Romans was written to explain the salvation of man. So because God is righteous, it shows our failures and leads us to realize that we need help in order to bridge that gap between God and us. And we know, obviously, that bridge between God and man was Jesus, and he provides salvation to all who believe in him. Now, in addition to these two purposes and the importance of this book, the outline that we're just going to go through in a second gives also greater detail and reveals so much more as to why the book of Romans was written. So let's get into the major teachings of the book of Romans. Letter A, we're going to start by talking about how Roman teaches the fundamental doctrine of salvation. The first section we'll look at are chapters 1 through 8. And in this section, Paul is expressly declaring the fundamental doctrine of salvation. Firstly, he says, the, the doctrine of salvation declares that salvation is necessary because we are condemned. We are condemned. Now, there's a few aspects of our condemnation that we need to look at. So let's look at letter A first. Our actions have condemned us. Now, following Paul's introductory information, he delves into the power of salvation coming from the gospel of Christ and the need for salvation because man is wicked. Now, some of the actions that he mentions that has condemned us are homosexuality, idolatry, fornication, murder, covetousness, and many, many more. And then he also makes the point that even those who have never heard about Jesus are without excuse because creation points to the Creator and that still does not change their actions. But not only have our actions condemned us, but also let her be, our condemnation will bring judgment. Paul mentions that while we are quick to judge others, all of our secrets will be judged by the Lord without escape. 
And he says that neither being a Jew and keeping the law, nor being a Gentile and not keeping the law, will save us from the judgment. Paul then concludes this section by pointing out that even if one did not believe in God, even if one was atheistic, this still will not keep him or her from judgment, since God is still true, even if man denies it. Then number two, not only does Romans declare that salvation is necessary because we are condemned, it also explains that salvation is accomplished through justification. Now, justification, a definition for that is the judicial act of God, whereby he declares righteous a believing sinner. But what is justification and how do we get it? Letter A, justification does not come from good works. The whole purpose of chapter 4 of Romans is to declare that this righteousness and justification does not come from good works. As an example, he points out that Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, believed God and his word, and then it was accounted for him for righteousness. Abraham was not saved by doing anything. He was saved by believing God and what he said. So this shows that it's faith that saves us, faith that justifies us, not our good works. But not only does faith, or excuse me, justification not come from good works, but letter B, justification brings peace with God through Jesus Christ. We find out in Romans chapter 5 that the fruit of our justification by faith is peace with God. Now this means contextually that the judgment that was going to be poured out upon us because of our sin and disbelief has been dissuaded. Therefore, we can rest easy or have peace. Now, this justification is made possible because God commended or showed his love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this peace here is not the peace of a funny feeling. This is the opposite of war. Because of our sin, God was at war with us. But once we believed on His Son as our Savior, we now have the peace of God on our lives. And then number three, not only does this section of Romans teach us that salvation is necessary because we're condemned, and also that salvation is accomplished through justification, but thirdly and lastly in this section, it proclaims that salvation begins the process of sanctification. Now, simply speaking, sanctification is being set apart and cleansed for God's use. But there's a couple aspects about sanctification that Paul wants to point out in the book of Romans. The first is letter A. He tells us that sanctification is not a license to sin. In chapter 5, he basically explains that you cannot out sin God's grace because you and I are believers in Christ, we are saved. No sin will keep us from heaven. But he starts off with chapter 6 saying, do not use that as an excuse to sin more. And he says, actually, God forbid that we would ever have the mentality that God is just going to forgive us, so we should go ahead and do it. So he's trying to explain that sanctification, being separated for God and cleansed by him, is not an excuse to do whatever we want. But let her be, Sanctification sets us free from the law. In chapter 7, Paul illustrates our freedom from the law by the picture of a wife being freed from matrimony by the death of her husband. Now, in this illustration, prior to salvation, we were married to the law. But now that we are saved, the law is dead, and we have been married to Christ, also known as grace. Now, this is not to say that the law is evil. There is just something better for us. And that thing better for us is Jesus. Why? Because his law is life. Now that we've looked at chapters 1 through 8 and how Paul explains the fundamental doctrines of salvation, in chapters 9 through 11, Paul discusses the extent and duration of Israel's unbelief. Now, as we've already discussed in this chapter, the gospel had a transition from the Jews to the Gentiles. But then that always begs the questions, what happens to the Jews now? What happens to Israel? 
Well, Paul's going to discuss this in three main points. In chapter 9, number 1, we find out that in the past, Israel was elected by God the Father. Now, in this chapter, Paul recalls how Abram was called by God and given a covenant from him and passed through his son Isaac and Jacob. And that covenant was to make a great nation for his sake. Now, because of this calling and this covenant, God has providentially taken care of his people as a potter would his clay. But not only has Israel been elected in the past, but number two, during the present, Israel has rejected Jesus. Paul desired that all Israel would be saved. However, since salvation comes through the confession of Jesus as Messiah and Lord, and Israel rejected Jesus as such, so much so that they crucified him, Paul says that they are in great spiritual danger. And then thirdly and lastly, in the future, Israel will be saved. Now, in spite of Israel's rejection of the Messiah, Paul is quick to point out that God is not done with Israel. He says that God has not cast them away. As there was in the Old Testament, there is a remnant of believing Jews in the New Testament times today. In fact, Paul even mentions that their slumber that they're experiencing now was, quote, God-given. And the good thing about this is that Israel's rejection allows us Gentiles to be grafted into the branch of reception. As Israel was God's people in the Old Testament, the church is God's people in the New Testament, not replacing them, but complementing them. While they are enemies of the gospel, they are still God's elect people. And Paul says that this calling he placed upon them is without repentance, meaning God will not change his mind. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 14 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.